so I'm going to inflict uh, some sketches of my experience as an American Foreign Service Officer in six assignments overseas. And this is really for all you students out there who are getting ready to do amazing things with your lives. Uh, I'm going to talk about what it means to be in public service and what it is like to represent your country overseas. Um, and in doing that, I, I really want to get some observations and lessons out there that have to do with how critical and important it is to understand and appreciate the perspectives of others, because that's really the essence, the essence of the job. Um, and I'm also going to talk about history and why the past is so important to, to connect us with our present and it will come, history is a part of your life whether you're aware of it or not. Uh, so let me start by explaining the title, Taking the Oath. So all of these people, you may recognize some of these pictures. These are people, most of them career public servants uh, in the United States, uh, who would be completely anonymous to us, except for they all testified in the congressional impeachment hearings. Well, every one of those people, before they could take their jobs, had to speak a version of this oath. Then don't, don't read it, let me read it to you. Um, I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservations or purpose of evasion, and I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter, so help me God. Those are serious words. And when you take that oath, you cross a threshold. Your word is your personal bond with the public. And with that, you assume trust. And in that sense, taking a public job like being in the Foreign Service is more than just, a, just a accepting a job offer. It means that you dedicate yourself to honor, um, to ethics, to um, serving and duty. Uh, so uh, let's go on to the next slide. A quick note about preparation. How did I get there? Uh, well, I was a surfer hippie from California and went to school in UC Santa Cruz, a school on the, uh, on the California coast that has a lot of similarities with United World College. Um, and I went there because I loved to learn. I then went to graduate school in completely the opposite environment at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C., where I got a graduate degree in international relations. And that turned out to be pretty good preparation when I joined the Foreign Service in 1980. Next slide. Except that it was an accident. I thought I was joining the Forest Service. <laughs> and I was going to be a park ranger. So, okay, no. <laughs> Almost. And that's a, an observation I want to make. John Lennon's immortal words, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Next slide. So here you have a, a recent class, if you can see through the origami, a recent class of Foreign Service officers with their arms raised, and they are literally speaking the oath. After that, after they say their oath, they get a commission, a written commission. It's like a diploma. It's approved by the Senate and signed by the President. I've had six of them because they served under six presidents. So, little little thought about careers. Um, here's the bureaucracy. This is the headquarters, State Department. 
And if you take the State Department and the Department of Defense and the Armed Forces and the Central Intelligence Agency and the dozens of agencies that have programs in international affairs and national security, you get a pretty messy situation and, and it's not all rosy. Believe me, there's plenty of infighting and difficulty. Um, but that's, that's the nature of the bureaucracy and of, uh, of diplomacy in a democracy. Um, most people who enter the Foreign Service want to serve in world capitals. And maybe they have an ambition like they want to end up being an ambassador. There's, that's a picture of the 4th of July party at the embassy in Paris, which would be sort of the pinnacle of that, that kind of career. Uh, well, I kind of chose a different direction which was to serve in the deepest back of beyond um, and trouble spots around the world. Um, next slide. So f my first post, El Salvador. Um, of course, I had come of age uh, in, during the top Vietnam War, 58,000 American soldiers killed, a national tragedy. So I was about to find out what a real revolution was like. Um, in El Salvador, I was the field reporting officer. And this was really the height of the Cold War, the crisis of our times, front page new, uh, television news every day. Well, there was an incident in which the first battalion, trained and equipped, by the United States, went out on their first operation and massacred almost a thousand men, women, and children. Well, my job was to go be the investigating officer of that massacre. So fast forward to today, that war is long over, and as a result of it, El Salvador is a democracy, and the, the El Mosote massacre case has been brought up in courts in the country where they're trying to get justice for the victims. And you can go Google this. There have been books written and movies made and that sort of thing. Uh, next slide. <coughs> After El Salvador, I joined a team that was uh, going around secretly negotiating with the Salvadoran guerrillas, the guys on the other side of the war, and uh, the Nicaraguan Sandinistas, uh, including Daniel Ortega, we used to call him Psycho Ortega. Um, he happens to be the president of the country right now. There's our, there's our airplane up there on the top, not the shadows. Um, in the middle of this, in the middle of this, the Iran-Contra scandal broke out. And that was the result of some people in the National Security Council who thought it was a good idea to sell arms to Iran in exchange for Middle Eastern hostages and use the money illegally to pay to support rebels that we were supporting in Nicaragua called the Contras. Well, that scandal almost wrecked the administration of Ronald Reagan. And I'm, I'm telling you about this because the echoes of today's a case of abuse of power that's currently the subject of Donald Trump's impeachment uh, is very strong. And this is another chapter in our long, long entanglement with Iran. Next slide. Well, I thought that that, that Iran Contra business was nuts. So I got out just in time, just before it broke, and went to Brazil as consul in Belo Horizonte, the country's third largest city. And if anybody knows Brazil, lifestyle note, uh, these are people who really know how to enjoy life. That's a, that's a picture of, of Carnival, the world's ul ultimate party, if you ever get a chance to go. Um, pretty incredible. But it was an interesting time because Brazil was going through a transition from military dictatorship to democracy. So that was a, quite an interesting break from one war to a transition of a different kind. Next slide. Another accident. When I was in Brazil, I got my orders for my next assignment. I thought I was being punished. Port Moresby, 
Papua New Guinea. Can you imagine a more remote, distant place on Earth? Uh, well, it turned out that it was incredible. Papua New Guinea is and always will be the, an ultimate uh, land of adventure. Um, and I don't, I don't regret a day of it. So there, I was on an island called Bougainville. And the day that I was there, just by chance, I had nothing to do with it, almost the entire population of the island rose up in re rebellion against their central government. That's an actual action shot of that day. Um, interestingly enough, just last December, so 30 years later, the people of the island, 98% of them voted for independence. Papua New Guinea, although it's remote, at the, during World War II, it was one of the central fronts in the war against Japan. It happened to be the place where you may have read about it without knowing. Um, it was where the Japanese commander, Admiral Yamamoto, was shot down in an intelligence operation by the Americans. His plane is still there on Bougainville Island. And this, you would have read about it because it is all the way back then that a senior government leader was assassinated by the United States up until January 3rd when a drone killed General Soleimani, the commander of the Iranian Quds Force. Um, another piece of this, this is, a, this is a diving expedition I was on to discover World War II wrecks. National Geographic did an article about it. That's my girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> Uh, she's diving on top of a Japanese biplane. Um, and the interesting thing about today is that those same very remote places where this war was the center of the world has once again become strategically important. Why? Because that is on the frontier of China's expansion into the, into the Chinese, the Asian, South Asian Sea. Next slide. So from Papua New Guinea, I went to Nepal. If you've been to Nepal, wonderful country, great people, that's right. Another land of adventure. I, uh, I climbed mountains and explored deep into the remote uh, Himalaya. Uh, I dated a princess. <laughs> True. Um, and while I was there, again, I had nothing to do with it, but there was a, it was, was the end of the Cold War, and there was a people power revolution um, that rose up uh, against the royal family. Uh, that's a, that's a, um, the palace in the background, sort of a B version of the Emerald City, um, and, uh, and instituted a democracy. Um, I tried to uh, halt a, a, a rising Maoist insurgency, uh, but failed because I couldn't convince anybody that the, that the Maoists really weren't communists. Um, and interestingly enough, again, connecting up to today, the shadowy leader, his name was Prachandra, who I would meet with in secret, today is the prime minister of Nepal. Um, oh yeah, and I learned, uh, I learned a really important lesson for you all not knowing whatever may happen in your life. Don't ever, ever, ever ride a mountain bike into a mass demonstration. <laughs> Next one. Okay, Angola. Angola in Africa. Um, the civil war in Angola when I was there was in its final phase. This was a major, major war. Very, uh, hundreds of thousands of people died. No, uh, went on for 27 years. Uh, not that much is really known generally about it. Um, but I sort of learned in that experience that uh, every war must come to an end. This idea of endless wars is a myth. Every war comes to an end, and it's how it, how it ends that really matters. Um, well, today, Angola is an extremely rich country. Because it has oil, it has diamonds. Oh, by the way, a, a majority of its oil goes to China. Um, it's also extremely corrupt. 
and most of the people still live in poverty. Uh, we used to go to, down to Namibia a lot, uh, the country to the south. It's a place where Africa works, um, uh, and a lovely place. Uh, and really between, between, uh, between Angola and Namibia, you have this test. What is the future of Africa going to look like? Um, I said we, that's because I met my wife there. Um, and we got married on the top of that fortress, uh, which was where the Portuguese, uh, when this was a colony, the Portuguese used to uh, ship out their slaves. So I mentioned uh, my wife, Marjolaine, uh, and you may uh, be interested uh, in having her come speak someday here. She's a humanitarian. When I met her, she was the head of the International Red Cross delegation, caring for 500,000 or so people in camps, much like the ones Takara showed you. Um, and uh, if you wanted to have her speak, uh, I'm sure she would be happy to when she gets back from Baghdad, where she's currently serving as the senior humanitarian advisor for the United Nations. Next slide. Finally, uh, Angola, uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan. Yeah, well, so after 9-11, uh, we invaded Afghanistan over through the Taliban government uh, and are still there today, all these years later. I spent about four years as a political advisor to combat units, um, uh, quite an interesting experience. Uh, and I'll just tell you one part of that. Shortly after I arrived, I was at uh, the big air base at, at Bagram, sitting uh, in a planning conference with the 82nd Airborne Division. 82nd Airborne are the guys that President Trump ordered to the Middle East uh, uh, when we had the recent escalation uh, with Iran. Um, by the way, sitting at the table was General Mark Milley, a little bit younger than, than today, but you've all seen his scowling face uh, next to the president, because he's the current uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the highest ranking officer in the US military. Um, I was sitting at the table, big wooden table, and I looked down, and I saw that somebody had like taken their knife and carved into it. And it was actually very well done Russian Cyrillic figures. I couldn't read them, but it dawned on me, oh my goodness, some Russian officer sitting in a planning meeting, very much like the one I was in, had carved those in back when the Soviet Union was fighting the Mujahideen, many of them the same people that we were fighting today. Um, go, go figure that one. Next slide. Well, the other thing that dawned on me while I was sitting there was that, oh my goodness, I had been in all three of the wars that the United States was involved in at the end of the Cold War. Central America, Angola, and Afghanistan. That's where I got the idea to write this book, The Blood of Others, and ended up getting invited to Oxford University uh, all things kind of go in a circle. Went to Oxford University to fulfill my long-term dream to get a doctorate. Um, and that's, that's Oxford College. It's got the greatest, uh, greatest club in all of Oxford. Mayor Pete Buttigieg, current candidate for president. Well, before he became candidate for president, he was president of the Middle Common Room, the club, which means he ran the bar, um, <laughs> which is in the, takes place in the in the rooms where J.R.R. Tolkien wrote The Hobbit. And it's also the place where, you guys know the X-Men? <laughs> Professor X from Oxford. He was from Pepper. So great school. Also a, a UWC uh, connection. Uh, the son of King Hussein, uh, his mother was Queen Noor, the son of King Hussein was also a uh, Pepper graduate. So to close, I'll just say I'm actually very happy to be able to be standing with you here today because the big lesson I learned from all this experience is that every day is gift. <laughs>